Welcome to Outer Space, International Arts and Class Travel Podcast. On this week's show, Radical Chicago Theatre and the Political Struggle in the USA. An interview with Dustin Spence. Commentary with Paul Paranoid. And music this week, Hard Work by Dustin Spence and Associates. Hi, I'm Rob McDonald, and I'm the host of Outer Space a Podcast. Uh, my guest today is Dustin Spence from Chicago. Hi, Dustin. Are you there? Hey, Rob. I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. Thanks for coming on the show. Um, Dustin, you, as far as I know, this is who I think you are, that you've uh, worked for 20 years or so in the theatre scene in Chicago. Um, you've run a storefront theatre company and you also work as a playwright now that's who i understand who you are is that who you are who do you think you are yeah no no that's uh that's about it i mean i've worn uh, pretty much every hat there is uh within the chicago theater scene um and yeah i'm happy to talk about it with you today <laughs> cool nice one man well that's what we want to go into really um there's two sides of it first of all uh, i should have mentioned also it's pretty critical that you're also a socialist and revolutionary activist uh, that's, right. yeah. <laughs> uh that, that's quite important for the show and for how we approach things uh you're not just some average playwright you're an activist on the street in in, in that theater as well so sure. What I want to cover today is I want to talk about the Chicago theatre scene in general um, it's, uh, and the political sides of it, uh, but also I want to talk a little bit about Chicago in the context of present day United States, because I think America is going through somewhat of a radicalization and polarized period, you know, on the, on the right and the left. And this podcast is about class struggle and the arts. So I kind of want to unpick your brain a bit about, first of all, how the scene is in Chicago in general uh, with the theatre, but also, you know, in, in the political context. So the first thing to sort of uh, ask you about is tell us a little bit about how the Chicago scene is for theatre today. Yeah. Well, uh, the Chicago theater scene is is huge. Um, in the the days before uh, the pandemic, and we were all uh, locked down, and live performance became rather difficult. Um, uh, the city uh, and the industry of uh, theater uh, in just the central district of Chicago alone, uh, there were spent. $2.25 billion annually um, on uh, live performance in theater. Um, and Chicago is uh, a, a hub for live performance. We have the most uh, theater companies of anywhere in the United States. Uh, the official number is over 200. Um, you know, depending on any given day, there are a lot that are unreported as far as that goes. Uh, so it's safe to say there are there are quite a few uh, theaters operating and, you know, over um, 6,000 theater artists that are uh, employed. And those are just the full-time folks uh, here in, in Chicago. Um, we operate uh, in a fashion that is certainly not unique to Chicago, but it certainly uh, it gives flavor to the scene um, where uh, there is definitely uh, the, the big houses, the, uh, the commercial uh, okay. theaters. Yeah, the, the big productions of like everything that would probably travel the world, those kind Absolutely. of that everybody would be familiar with in, in the West End in London, for example, mm -hmm. these kind of things. Yes. And, and Chicago is actually a place that many of those uh, productions end up being tested out. They come and do what's called a sit down uh, here in Chicago for a year or so before they go off to the, wi uh, the wider world markets. Um, and that, you know, is a significant portion of, of the, the theater. But um, 
not, I think, what what makes uh, Chicago sort of unique in that way. Uh, right. We have a scene that we call the uh, the storefront theater scene um, mm -hmm. that is largely based out of very small, normally a hundred seat or less uh, theaters. Um, I think my my personal smallest house was a, a house of. Uh, 15 <laughs> in the wow, audience okay. and that was the capacity of the theater was 15 um, and so uh, Chicago is sort of marked by uh, this hyper intimate uh, realistic uh, sort of gritty theater style um, mm. that came out of uh, the you know it's sort of modeled after the work of Steppenwolf Theater Company uh, that was founded in uh, the 1970s um, and gained a lot of notoriety because, um, you know, not only because they did really good work, but uh, some famous people, uh, Gary Sinise, John Malkovich, Laurie Metcalf came out of uh, that theater company. Um, and it was sort of built on this model of a group of friends in a church basement started doing plays and then those plays were seen as high quality and they, they built a, a, a you know, uh, a reputation based on that. Uh, and so since then, largely Chicago theater has been built on that model, though recent days have uh, really tested uh, whether or not that's still the best option for uh, theater artists and, and what, what other things are, are available you, to be you done. You mean because of COVID time yeah. or those kind of things? Yeah, well, we'll, we'll come on to that maybe a little bit later because I think that's interesting how, how, the, mar how, how the scene adapts and especially sure. as it, it would seem to me, I mean, I'm not a big theater buff. Uh, in series two, though, of these, this podcast, we're entering a lot of different theater questions. Mm. And, and for me, it feels I've always fancied it myself. I'll be dead honest with you. Um, I've never I've done quite a lot of different arts, but I've never really done the boards. It's mainly because I got a bit of a memory thing, and I always think I'll never remember the lines or whatever. <laughs> anyway, I'm kind of interested in it for because it's powerful theatre in a way that TV is very removed from people, and we live in that age. Theatre is it's the oldest. You know, uh, it's the longest running thing, but it's very near people. I mean, these big productions, not so, eh? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But even like working class pantomimes and this kind of thing. Absolutely. You know, it's, very, it's very ingrained in, in, in class culture. But theatre itself, and this, I'm very interested, you just develop a little bit more, if you can, this store, uh, this store idea, the store mm -hmm. theatre, yeah. because it... When he first said store, I thought, what does he mean? Store? Store like a battery or something? And then I thought, oh, no, he means a shop in English. Yes, uh, in, yeah. In, in, in proper English. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Of course, things <laughs> as well. Um, but, yeah, could you explain a little bit more about how that functions? I mean, you ran one of these places. Mm -hmm. um, they see it, it would strike me that that's the energy of the scene, you know, these kind of places. How, how do they function? Is it professional, semi-professional? And also, what kind of stuff do they put on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, storefront theater is, uh, in many ways, just just that. It's it's a store or a shop um, space that uh, is uh, has been converted into uh, a theatrical space. Um, and so, largely, uh, what that means is that whoever the the owner of the building is um, has you know painted all the walls black maybe installed some chairs into the floor um, and, uh, you know, put up a, a grid into the ceiling to attach lights to, like some bars or, or things like that, something you can hang uh, so it's a minimally lights. kind of situation. Very much so, very much so. Um, and so um, very often uh, there will be little to no dividing line between uh, the outside world and, and the theater world. Um, and you have to often navigate that. So, you know, in many of the spaces, um, an actor will leave the stage and they'll have to literally go out of the door of the building and out onto the sidewalk. Um, and so this makes for a very, um, uh, a very liminal space, you know, a, a place where, you know, you're sort of between worlds in your production where mm. the, the, you know, you can hear the sounds of the city as you are sitting in the audience and are supposed to be transported to, to somewhere else. Um, I, I wrote a, 
a play about Afghanistan, and it was was fascinating to hear the clear sounds of you know Chicago police sirens going by on the street <laughs> when you're supposed to be you know somewhere uh, uh, somewhere in Kabul. Um, and in some so sort it, of dust, dusty sort absolutely. of. <laughs> ruined buildings kind of desperate situation and you got the cops whirring by well right they, uh, they've got Absolutely. they've got the same cops whirring by but they're in different sure, uniforms. sure. <laughs> yeah yeah or or even better the uh you know the the drunken people out for a friday night you know just yeah. going by on the sidewalk right like so these are the kinds of things that make up um you know the the spaces themselves and largely um, theater artists, and I, I don't think this is unique to Chicago, but, um, you know, you spend uh, a majority of the budget of your show, which is not, uh, you know, not government subsidized, not, you know, very few of the productions have grants, things like that. Um, so, you know, we're, we're uh, throwing independent fundraisers to, to raise money for these things. Um, and, and, normally roughly 50% or over 50% of your budget simply goes towards um, getting access to these spaces, right, um, yeah. you know, and, and so it makes it um, by, by that nature, you have to do very pared down productions. Um, so uh, a lot of, uh, you know, simplistic scenery and simplistic uh, 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 costumes and things like that, really relying on uh, the spoken word and the actor's ability to sort of conjure up in people's minds what's going on. And we think that there are, there are real advantages to this because it forces the audience to really deal with what is in front of them. Um, and it has a great way of connecting to the here and now um, which I think sort of crosses over into the potential for uh, different uh, political themes that you can draw throughout. And, and that's a, a thing that many Chicago theaters uh, attempt to focus on as far as that goes. Right. Well, that, that was the kind of question. I mean, I was going to come to that. I mean, one of the things is about these grand theaters, the spectaculars, the, you know, yeah. this kind of thing. It's not to be sniffed at because it's, in, it's impressive sometimes, that kind of mm -hmm. thing, but it's a different thing. And I think what you're talking about, this gritty, on-the-street kind of thing, um, and just the method of it, the very personalized nature of, of the art form itself, but also yeah. the situation you're talking about with the storefront, very interesting. And it, it draws me onto the question of what kind, what kind of political stuff is coming out in that environment? What, mm -hmm. what kind of discussions are being had? What kind of plays are put on? What are received well? This kind of thing. It, it, is there something to be said there? Is there some energy going on? Yeah, I mean, it's um, in terms of the, the recent past, I mean, I think it's helpful to sort of uh, theater has been so impacted by yes. um, the, the COVID pandemic, um, particularly in these small spaces where there is nowhere to go. Um, you know, the the uh, head of, of the of Trump's health department um, just said that the uh, that we can't expect theater spaces to open until a year after um, a vaccine is found. Wow. Um, if that gives you an idea of sort of how it's impacting uh, at least the theater scene here in the States. Um, but the, the general themes, I think there has been this real overlap of um, political action with um, performers and the shows that they put on and really mm -hmm. trying to um, link these ideas of, you know, political action um, and political idea into the stories that are being told. Um, the, and this has taken on a few different forms, you know, uh, on the one hand, it can be um, shows that are, are generally about uh, a topic and then linking it to uh, some uh, area nonprofit. Uh, so like doing a show, uh, there were, there were a number of shows in in the wake of some of the the school shootings here mm -hmm. in the United States um, that uh, were centered on that topic of gun violence, gun violence as it relates in the American context within schools and things like that, um, and then uh, trying to connect that up with um, organizations that were specifically fighting against um, you know 
gun violence and and you know what, that, they, that, the, 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 that. they they would sponsor it or they would have their name on it or they would have a table at it that kind of thing yeah that sort of thing absolutely um and so a, a big uh I think the other the other uh, thing that is is more prevalent, and I think is becoming even more prevalent, um, is uh, Chicago theaters very regularly have what are called talkbacks. So the show will end. The a member of the show, or sometimes the entire cast, will come out uh, out of costume and will talk with the audience about the themes of the show, answer questions, ask them uh, things like that. Um, and so it has the potential to really, um, I think, engage people in a way rather than saying, oh, well, this is the work of, of some other group. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, it, it encourages them to take part um, and to, to take action around these things. Um, and, you know, uh, here recently, uh, you know, the, the world has seen the... Um, <clears throat> the response to the shooting of, of George Floyd, uh, not the shooting, the, the murder of George Floyd uh, by police officers in, in Minneapolis, um, and just the, the global outcry um, around that. Um, this was a conversation uh, that was already going on uh, within, I mean, the United States generally, which is why I think the, the response was as huge as it was. Mm. Um, but here in Chicago um, in 2015, uh, uh, the police uh, murdered a young man by the name of uh, Laquan McDonald. Uh, they shot him 16 times uh, while he was lying prone on the street. Um, and uh, this really sparked um, mass outrage here in the city. Um, and Chicago is one of the most segregated cities in the United States. Yeah, um, I mean, I was going to ask you a little bit about yeah. Chicago and, and the politics of, of the place mm -hmm. and the history, because I, I had a chat with you briefly before, and I, I've always had this vision of this sort of uh, manufacturing city that's gone to hell, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I don't know much, I'll be dead honest with you, but it's I had sure. this wept sort of hard city with big mm -hmm. racial divides. I mean, yeah, what, yeah. what is the, give us a little bit of political context to, to the things you're saying. Sure. I mean, so Chicago, for, for those who may not be from the U.S., <laughs> um, yeah. is, is in sort of the center of the country um, and uh, what we call the, the industrial Midwest. Um, it at one point was the center of manufacturing in the United States um, and still has the region still has quite a bit of manufacturing, uh, though it's not nearly as prevalent as it was in the you know, uh, first part of the 20th century. Um, but the city itself was sort of built on um, the, you know, that uh, manufacturing, being a manufacturing hub, um, largely, uh, you know, one of the significant things was for uh, uh, animal slaughter. Uh, farmers would bring, uh, you know, livestock in, and this was uh, the stockyards would process the meat and then send it out to other parts of, of the country from here, uh, which also meant that uh, this was uh, the center for a lot of uh, railroad manufacturing because you had to get all of that product out to other places. Um, and so, of course, side by side with that, um, as, as a socialist, uh, I know that that then is linked with um, mass struggle and, and organizing. Um, the, uh, the Haymarket incident uh, in the, yes, the late course. 80s, um, yes. yeah, uh, happened right here in Chicago um, in the fight for the eight-hour workday. Um, and there are still, uh, you know, uh, monuments to that here, here in the city, um, though it, it has been uh, a part of our history that I think uh, is not as uh, widely known as perhaps it once was. Yeah, I mean, just for the listeners who yeah. aren't sure what that would mean, this is the where May Day starts, or where, where the first struggle uh, first incident, the Hayfair incident is where that kicked off. It was some years later that it was called uh, the May Day and many international uh, places have a big demonstration on May Day with the exception of probably the United States. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> it's just a little information point there. I think it's very, it, it, so it's critical in working class histories. Absolutely. You know? 
Absolutely. And, and so uh, from there, uh, what, what Chicago later experiences in, in its history is um, what was called the, the first great migration of uh, black workers from, from the South, um, largely looking to uh, get out of the South and, and looking for jobs and things like that. Um, huge portions of them, along with uh, poor working class whites, came to Chicago. Um, to uh, find a life for themselves and to, to find work. Um, and so from that period of time, uh, the, the city is, uh, was incredibly racially divided um, based on the, you know, the politics both of the time and quite frankly of the city still to this day. Um, literally, mayors um, built... Um, major highways to go through the middle of black uh, neighborhoods um, in an effort to keep them uh, isolated from the rest of the city um, and to, to keep the, the city actively segregated. Um, and that's been a move uh, by the people in power here in the city uh, for, for a very long time up to this day. Mm. Um, and so I, I think probably the, of the, the big capstone of, of uh, the Chicago political scene um, is that in, in recent history, the last um, four or five years, we've had two uh, major uh, events. Um, and I think one has been the response to the murder of Laquan McDonald by the Chicago Police Department um, and its subsequent um, cover up by both the police department and by the mayor. Um, and uh, this sparked uh, sort of a, a mass response throughout the city, um, led to quite a bit of turnover within our city council, an attempt to um, elect people who are more representative of uh, the working class throughout the city. Um, I worked on, on two of those campaigns, uh, and it's had sort of mixed results, but it's happened. Mm. Um, and uh, the, the other thing uh, has been uh, the, the largest union in Chicago is the Chicago Teachers Union. Um, and they have since uh, 2012 gone on two major strikes. The last one happened uh, around this time last year. Um, and it was, uh, it was not the longest strike that the teachers have ever been on, but it's certainly uh, one of the longest in recent memories. Um, and it activated the entire city um, into this struggle. Um, you know, teach, uh, because of course, teachers being out means that uh, parents have nowhere to send yeah. their kids, an experience that we're having right now in a, in a lot of ways with COVID um, and all of that, right? Um, but these two actions have politicized the city in a way that it really hasn't been um, in recent memory. And this has trickled into the theater scene. Yeah, I was um, going to ask you about that. What, how, how has that happened? Yeah. Yeah, what, what's, been, what's been the uh, connection? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so it, when when we talk about the the racial divide within the city, theater is not um, uh, immune to that, um, and I think that was the first big response um, to uh, uh, to some of these movements. Um, and this was closely linked um, with huge um, gender discrepancies and uh, sexual abuse within the industry, particularly by um, people who ran some of these, these theater companies. Um, and so what came out of it, uh, it was, it was really incredible to see, um, there were mass community meetings that were called, um, theater artists coming together in a way that recognized sort of a common interest throughout the industry in, um, solving the problem of, uh, sexual abuse, uh, solving the problem of more, uh, representational inclusion on stage um, around these things. And I think um, in, the, in the early days of a lot of this, um, it, was, it was really, really hopeful of that by having these mass meetings, um, we could come up with a way to, to uh, solve many of these, these problems. Um, and I think to a certain degree, there, there has been a shift that's been really good uh, within the theater scene. Um, but I think one of the, the weaknesses that came out of it is 
um, what developed was not on the basis of continuing these mass meetings or continuing having any way for artists to really come together and touch base across the industry. Mm -hmm. um, instead, uh, the, the, the power of the structures that was developed was put largely in the hands of individual productions. You know, mm -hmm. um, discuss at the beginning of your show um, what you know, uh, what is safe and what is not, which w was still a, a significant step forward um, in terms of, you know, actor safety uh, within rehearsal spaces and performance, but it largely meant that it was disconnected from the, the wider struggle of uh, the industry as a whole. This, and this so, is, yeah. So, so, no, sorry, I mean, it's great what you're saying. It's just that this is the big question. You know, it's the reason mm -hmm. for this podcast. Yeah. You know, you're talking here about artist organizing. You're talking about the, the wider struggle. And so, you know, yeah, I shouldn't have interrupted you really. But, you know, I, I'm very interested on how the, first of all, arts have always taken up social questions, whichever sure. it is. You know, but there are big questions that are never talked about politically in the wider, you know, the need to yeah, working class totally. to organize, particularly in the States. There need to be a party of the working class. It's the same in many other countries as well. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not represented in, 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 in those kind of political things. The class struggle you mentioned about the trade unions and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So social struggles, I can imagine being at the beginning and sexism and all these things, very important. But yeah. how... How how could they develop? How how would you foresee that uh, these structures could be? Do you think we should f have a wider artist union? Or I mean, I know there are unions like in England of equity of actors, but they're very much based on payment questions and and these kind of things. What do you think about uh, how can we organise? Is kind of what I'm arguing. And is there something in Chicago that can be a bit of a a light for people to look at? Yeah, well, and I think this is this is really important um, because there there is an actor union, there are mm -hmm. stagehand unions, um, but they they largely um, uh, leave the question of being in a union not to uh, being an experienced actor, not to uh, protecting actors or stagehands as a whole, but uh, it's more uh, a sign that you have achieved a certain level of, uh, you know, of your artistry. So it's far closer to like a craft union than, uh, uh, than an industrial union. Um, and I think uh, the ability to shift artist organizing and theater organizing more into that uh, industrial model where it reaches for everyone across the entire industry um, is, is I think going to be a key step. And I, th I think this is why uh, it's important to point to uh, the social uh, struggles that developed because this was a moment where people recognized uh, in Chicago and this model uh, for, for uh, all its weaknesses has spread across the United States and, been and is being currently used as a model for um, protecting uh, theater artists, which I think is, is really important. But to know that that was built uh, from uh, mass organizing of having people coming together and deciding for themselves what the structures would look like as opposed to having, you know, some professional uh, union boss say, okay, we've got this, we're going to take care of this mm -hmm. for you. Um, I think those are the kinds of shifts that would be really important um, if, if we're going to uh, point in the direction of, you know, having uh, theater be uh, an industry where you can actually uh, earn a living wage and work reasonable hours and, and have workplace control and things like that. Um, these are the kinds of things that we can build on. And I think uh, Chicago is, is uh, somewhat uniquely positioned to put forward models like this because we've already been trying to figure out how to answer that question, even if it hasn't been 100% successful. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. And, and, and we're going we're gonna to get you back in the future to keep <sighs> us up to date with all these movements. But, well, it's often the place that's the center of an industry where radicalism can grow first. You know, we, we've got, so it's important. There are obviously other places in the world and, and we'll develop there. But I want to finish on a, uh, on a, on a, on a, another broad question, but one that sure. I'm, I'm interested in your view and that is on COVID, you know, mm. and, and, and how, 
I had a chat uh, in a previous podcast with an English company, and I'll put the link to that in this. And they were they were stuck <laughs> um, because theatre has been crunched by the COVID uh, crisis. Um, as an industry in culture and arts in general, it's a massive problem, you know, and therefore this is a reason to organise as well. But because we're not previously particularly organised that well as artists or in, in the scene, and as you've just explained, it's less, left us a bit weak. But what is good about the theatre is the store company sizes that you've talked about and the size of the other company was just two of them actually um and that was the whole company uh, ah, one, yeah. one was the actor and one was the producer and they they shared all the different roles and they they turned one of their productions into a podcast you know and that's mm -hmm. a way to keep it alive uh, how do you see let's say the covid thing goes on for a number of years you know mm -hmm. um and let's say this is the world we're in now how how are we going to respond as artists? We'll have to be political about it. We're going to have to fight. You know, uh, do, you, do you have a view on, on, on what's, A, what's going on in Chicago with that? How is it responding? Or are we just staying at home for a lot? <laughs> are we doing a lot yeah. of reading or something? Or are you writing a lot of plays about COVID but not doing them? You know, how's it going? Do you think there's a scene developing at the moment, uh, a way of coping with this? Yeah, well, and I think this is, uh, again, this is sort of the, the interesting thing about being in a city that, that it sort of uh, tries to find new spaces and new ways of doing things, you know, as just a part mm. of our, our regular artistic Senior experience. DNA to be different. Right, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know. Why is that? Sorry, uh, why is that, by the way? Why, why is, what's special? Why, why, why do people hone into uh, Chicago? What's, what's going on there? Is it cool or something? Or is it nice weather or you got good bars? Is, is <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, all of those things, though, I would, I would emphasize how particularly cold it gets, uh, particularly <laughs> compared to Barcelona, right? Yeah, 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 that's true. <laughs> um, but, uh, no, I mean, so uh, there is definitely an adage that, that American theater artists uh, tend to, to point to, particularly those of us in Chicago, where, where you say, you know, if you want to do musicals, go to New York. Right. Okay. If you want to want to do films, want to do movies, you go to L.A. Um, and if you want to do real theater, you come to Chicago. Right. Um, and one of the things that uh, Chicago sort of allows for is that relative to those two other places, the, the cost of living is relatively low. Um, still expensive, but, yeah. uh, you know, not, not as bad. Um, and so that also means that, that the cost of putting on a production, um, isn't, uh, insane. Um, right. it, it can be super expensive. Um, but you know, the first production I, I, uh, produced, uh, that I developed, uh, we did for $2,500, which right. is nothing. I mean, and largely that depends on a question of who are you paying and what are you paying for? And as yeah. I was saying earlier, most of that money just went to renting the space. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but that, that low cost of entry, I think is, is one thing that's unique to Chicago. Um, but also a lot of people come here with the interest in developing new work. Okay, um, yeah. so and back, I think to, back that, to the question of what you're going to do about COVID then. Chicago. Yeah. Moscow, tell and, us. And I think, that, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is, that is the center of it. And so most, many artists, not all, but many artists are, are really developing around this idea of what does um, a, a show look like if you were to produce it and perform it on Zoom? Uh, what does it look like to do it as a radio play? We already had prior to this um, a, a very large um, outdoor theater scene. Um, so the idea of doing things socially distanced and, and things like that um, is a possibility, though we have... Uh, uh, relatively a relatively small window of uh, good weather days. So like outdoor spaces probably aren't there for the long term. But I think a lot of artists are moving into these these uh, virtual spaces and figuring out ways, you know, Zoom being particularly good for it because you can still do it live. Mm. Um, and I think that's a, a big part of all of this. Um, that that new play sense makes actors go, okay, um, how do I perform both, you know, 
live, but also for a camera or playwrights trying to figure out, okay, I would have these actors interact, but they're all in their own little window. So how do I get that sense of interaction and the energy off of the audience as well while being in a virtual space? And so these are, these are the things that I think are developing here in Chicago. I mean, it makes it really, really cool. Mm. Sounds really interesting. Well, look, Dustin, we've kind of we've kind of run out of a bit of time this time. Um, I think sure. we've opened up a lot of stuff. And you mentioned one thing there that I was going, okay, let's talk about that, and that was about space. You know, I mean, this is outer space podcast. Oh, yeah. One of the reasons we call it that is because there is a problem of spaces. You know, mm-hmm. for, for doing things. So uh, we'll come back to that one. We'll come back and see how the sure. scene develops. Um, Thank you very much for coming on the show. Super interesting stuff. Uh, uh, And we'll see you again soon. Yeah, no worries, man. Uh, And you take care, yeah? Yeah, you too. Bye now. Okay, then, let's take ourselves up to the space station to find Mr. Paranoid Paul. Are, are you up there, mate? Are you up there? It, it is Paul Paranoid. You've got to get it the right way around. <laughs> what, do I, what do I say? Paranoid Paul? You keep calling me Paranoid Paul, which just sounds like an insult. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they sound very similar to me, those two things. Anyway, how, how are you doing today up there? Is it? Is I'm it I'm, I'm just watching. I just finished watching my videotape of Chicago to get warmed up for this. I'm in a kind of like a, I'm in a kind of, you know, musical, festy mood. So you've been you've been going around the room making a cup of tea and then singing about sugar and things like that and then just breaking into song. Is that what you've been doing? Uh, and all that jazz. Oh God, blimey. Okay, so it sounds to me like Paul that there's. This one touches you a little bit. Um, you've got a little bit of history, have you, with theatre? Uh, yeah, you... I did theatre. I studied theatre in the uh, late eighties and early nineties. Okay. I, so... have, uh, I, I have. I, I did a B Tech in drama at South Warwickshire College, which I have very fond memories of that time. Uh, the same college that Ben Elton and Simon Pegg were at. Mm-hmm. And then I went on to do university, but the skin of my teeth went to university and I did uh, a, a degree in uh, theatre studies. Uh, and uh, I did it because I really wanted to do music, as you know, as everybody knows, I think, what listens to this. But there was no B-Tech course or A-level course or degree course in, in music. And I just need, I was, I didn't have the courage really to go on stage. And I knew the best way, therefore, to break that virginity was to you know go and study theater that's the only way to do it i didn't i didn't realize you did that i certainly didn't know you took it to degree level so so you're well tuned up for this and it has to be said that the world needs to know that we are from shakespeare's country you know uh, both me and paul are both from rugby um and if you enter rugby if you're ever lucky enough to do that uh, rugby in the middle of england then you will pass the sign that says rugby and underneath it will say shakespeare country which is a bit bizarre because it kind of isn't um actually it's stratford and is that when you said south london south i think it's the county i think it's as you went to the county. Uh, like warwickshire thing uh, okay yeah. so warwickshire is shakespeare country because obviously shakespeare's company was in stratford am i correct stratford upon avon is where shakespeare is meant to have come from there is some controversy about the uh, there is a there is a controversy about the real Shakespeare and if he really mm. came from there. Yes. But but the, but the person that they have assigned the William Shakespeare that wrote the plays to is the one that comes from Stratford upon Avon. Um, some people think, and that's a whole other conversation we'll have some time. But there, there is a very interesting controversy about whether Shakespeare could conceivably have written in those plays. But of course he could have. I mean, he's he actually very interesting. Skin. I mean, I, we, let's not delve too much because I want to get down to the sure. show. But actually, I did study for one year before I left um, English at university. And one of the things I found opened my eyes a little bit was studying a bit of Shakespeare. And I was like of the opinion no he didn't write all these <laughs> he just was the, he just he just ended up owning them all um whoever this mr william was um yeah let's not go there but the important thing is we're from that part of the world so we're entitled to say anything we like about uh, about theater or well, and indeed rugby 
<laughs> Indeed, well, maybe we, we can't say anything about theatre properly, but we certainly can about rugby. But that that brings me to one of the things about this interview that I learned something from. Um, and we've done in this series, we've done or doing, if you haven't heard them yet, we've got a lot of theatrical stuff we're going to be talking about. You know, yeah. a UK UK company, Townsend Productions. We're going to go to Cyprus. Uh, Cyprus, Greece, and this is, you know, theatre again is a huge thing historically. And then this was interesting for me because this seems like in the English speaking world, the biggest, most powerful country in many ways, obviously, United States. And then it seems to be that theatre, the hub of theatre comes from Chicago, which was, I didn't really know. Um, so I think we've got something quite interesting here um, from Dustin. Um, and for me, I don't know, what did you, what did you think? Because for me, we, we could talk a little bit about the power of theatre in society uh, based on, on this discussion with him. Because he talks about these store theatre things, you know, um, I mean... What, what did you pick up from that conversation? Because for me, it was really interesting that theatre being so close to people made it sort of kind of political. Uh, it's always fascinating when you hear about any kind of like sort of, uh, what do they call it when they sort of pop up? Is that a pop-up theatre pop situation? Up theater. Or, pop up, yeah, yeah pop-up art is a big thing at the moment, isn't it? Um, so pop-up theatres, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, there is this like very like tradition in theatre of, politicized uh theater groups that just sort of uh are almost kind of like in a way because me and you come really most of our focus is on is on music and like the idea of like the political sort of musical bands the sort of like the punk bands and the sort of uh and, and people that people that have a kind of a, a left ideology uh, doing it through music and joe joe solo obviously is doing that we, we kind of like don't talk much about the theater version because the theater version has got a much older and much more entrenched tradition of that um uh and I got, interestingly when i was at south warwickshire college uh studying into gordon valens he was a massive Bertolt brett he's been mm. his hero and i saw a, a production of mother courage he did and i was in a production of or the irresistible rise of Otto ui which is a, a satire on the rise of adolf hitler and i was in that with greg who's the drummer was the first drummer in my darling nihilist and uh, and and um that's when we became friends and and, and basically um uh it, it, you know it, rock and roll was quite late to the party mm. the political theater is uh, and, and we can go even go back to the German Expressionists at the start of the uh, last century who saw what was coming before the First mm. World War. And they were, and that's my favourite uh, period of theatre. Um, German Expressionists were right on my street and uh, they, they sort of did um, their plays. The only, the, only, the, the, the Nazis destroyed most of their work um, and most of the records of their work. But there, is one, there was one remaining... Um, artifact and that, that that has managed to make it and that's the cabinet of dr caligari which you may have seen or mm. may have heard about which is uh, the last i think it's pretty much the most uh the biggest german expression thing we've got left and that what it is about the german expressionists is they saw well they saw all the stuff that we talk that we worry about they saw it mm. coming in a yeah, around nine, i think nine, this is really yeah. interesting paul you know because what what we're talking about here is an art form which is very susceptible to picking up the social moods um particularly yeah. this what we're talking about here we're not talking about the west end fuck that for a minute um <laughs> and we're talking about the theaters that touch the public we're talking about the state uh, what the store store theaters pop-up theaters theater that's uh, that's touched Touching the community, you know, even community theatre, um, that actually in the in that environment generates a dialogue and a discussion like like would have been Greek theatre, like would have been Shakespeare's time. You know, we can wind it back into history, but probably before any great movements, then theatre is probably talking about shit in advance. Yeah. Um, and so this for for us on the show, but in general, is something that should be noted. You know, um, what? Why do you think it is? Why? Why? Why is it that theatre is is better at television than that, or is it not better? You know, is it's it? Not, it's, it's not. It's not that it's better or anything. It's just that with television and film, you're working in a corporatized sort. Of, is that a word? You're working in a corporate yeah. environment, and and basically, with theatre, six people. It's look. It's like a band. 
but mm. the difference is is that whereas a band is about in, you know, primarily about entertaining people and you can you can bend left if you want but you're always stuck with the fact that you're like what with com it's the same problem that comedy's got like um you, 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 your your job is to entertain people and you're you're probably going to be hemmed in by the the social strata that you're in doing it like so do you we, don't we, get we fall off basically you don't get drawn into well, it's, no, it's, you, it's, you, it's, you're always going to be talking about what's in front of you is that what you say it, it, no 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 I, I, my point is more this it's like but like it's, if you want to be if you want to be like an arty band in a very rough area where are you going to find your audience that's mm. a problem and you and you have to kind of build and of course the pistols got around that by by kind of creating a kind of a a sort of a pseudo art school college scene which wasn't one but kind of attracted some people like that and, and and all the kind of make your own clothes and all that sort of thing so it became a movement that's how they got around it they were in london however but you know like so when you know when people like bands have to face that and they can't always do it they can't always do it they might the, the, the creative sort of they might be crushed by the actual environment they're in that doesn't allow artistic expression or whatever or they find or even more better even, even better they find a way to sort of like now but with theater as soon as you've got people that are prepared to sit down and listen and watch a piece of work in the format of a play which has now been established and built like it's there we know what it is in fact in a way theatre's come under probably under threat from things like television and film because a lot of people and i've experienced this myself having come from that generation um a lot of people go to see a television or go to see a play Whose, whose only real understanding of drama might be stuck at the feet, like watching EastEnders or something, mm -hmm. and they then compare it constantly to the experience of watching a TV show or a film, when theatre isn't those things. I mean, theatre is somewhere... Yeah, but you well, know when you go to a theatre that it blows your mind, even if it's not very good, and you just yeah. look, at the, you look at the person. You know, you're actually looking at them, and you, you, you can even forget the storyline, and you can just get lost in, in something that's going on at the back of the stage. You know, and I think comparing that to EastEnders, where there's obviously a lot of good drama and acting going on, even whatever you might think, it's formatted mm -hmm. obviously far too much. But I think theatre uh, provides all that. So I don't know. It's, I'm, oh, sorry, you I'm got not, more. I'm not, I'm, not attack, I'm, not, I'm not attacking theatre, you understand. I'm saying that the references that people bring to theatre sometimes can get in the way of actually experiencing it. But the, but the job of the theatre and the play is to break through that so the reason i'm answering your question from earlier about why is political theater why is it um what why, why does it fit and the reason mm. it fits is it can be done a with very little resources it can a lot of it is human will like human will is the most important resource in whether you do it or not i mean you can do it with no costumes and no set if you need to and many people do great work like just dressed in black in a, on a black stage with a table if necessary i mean that that happens you know i mean look yeah. at, and also like and when, people, when people put plays on in the edinburgh festival fringe they can't bring in enormous sets it really is dependent that's why the edinburgh festival is such a a vital uh, thing that we do because that you really are literally just it's just we're just running most of it i mean sorry there are there are shows that are well well established in the, at the edinburgh festival but they do have yeah i mean no we're, we're we're knocking it about a bit here trying to draw out what what the political nature of theater is which i think are at the yeah, level of store theater community theater theater yeah. that touches people and so i think i think that's uh, i think that's quite so, important and also we talked to townsend productions and they're two people you know yeah um and or one person on the stage um yeah. so <clears throat> the point yeah, you're so making is so, valid so, so to my point i'm just saying the reason political theater has got such a sort of uh, a, a sort of a uh, a resilience right is because the will of the people that want to do it is the strongest and once you get people once people are agreeing on the format of sitting in the environment and paying attention to the stage which you can't guarantee you're going to have even at a rock and roll show i mean if you're mm. if you're playing a rock show and you're a left-leaning songwriter and your band i mean they don't they don't even have to like you man they can throw things at the stage you know but with theater you've got this format and it and as long as you are adhering to the format of the show being something that can be followed and having a beginning a middle and an end and all that sort of thing you know you you're you've got a you've got a hope and 
and a lot of places, a lot of these touring theatre companies that go around the country, there are theatres that want to put stuff on. It might be hard to get people in, but the theatre might as well try it. You might be on on Tuesday night, you know what I mean, before you go on mm. to your next your next sort of booking, you know. But that's, that's why I think theatre has struggled, obviously, with technology coming in and, 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 and taking up so much of the... Uh, the sort of the space of entertainment in people's minds but uh, that's my answer to your question anyway it yeah no good i mean yeah. we're, we're running out a bit of time for for for, for now but I, I just want to throw in one little twister of what i pulled out of it which is interesting and it's it's a theme that's coming in all of the discussions on theater and the other ones and that was I mean, it was sort of around the discussions around COVID and, you know, and 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 the effects on theatre right now, because theatre has been smashed, you know, um, by COVID problems and all the rest of it. But what I found really interesting that was coming out of this lively underground type scene was that the political connections with uh, theatre companies and people coming together in uh, what he called like a mass campaign kind of thing around the the questions of race which is a massive question in america massive question everywhere but particularly in the states because of the police murders that take place but also you know he talked a little bit about how uh, and the women's movement that's developed as well and how to tackle sexism and how there was a politicization within the theater not necessarily what they were putting on but connecting up with the social movement I mean, and I found that interesting. He talked that there was a, there'd been there'd been uh, mass meetings where they discussed how to deal with it, and he also criticised that movement, um, which I found interesting because he was saying, well, you know, there are like craft unions, not really industrialised unions for 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 artists, and this is one of the things we've been talking about quite a lot, and I think it's a valid point to say. There are different types of unions within the arts already because we talk about how do we get organized as artists where there are art unions but often they're not very good because they're more of a craft get up the ladder kind of union rather than an industrial have a fight for the community kind of union so that was really interesting what he noted and also that you know that they'd come together but then they sort of allowed the companies to kind of go off and just have chats before before the before the production or afterwards or have a table at it but hadn't gone any further at this stage but he also talked about and i'll just throw this in because i'm conscious of time the it came out of a previous struggle of the of the teachers union which is a big union in chicago so all that energy there was really interesting and when i asked him at the end about covid and he, his answer was, well, we're looking at new ways because that's how we do it in Chicago. It's kind of what you were saying, yeah? Um, and I found that interesting, uh, that what new things are going to come out of this situation where theatre gets smacked, maybe for a couple of years, even if COVID is sort of got under control, you know, how will it recover? What kind of productions are going to be put on? And how, you know, how will it all sort of un- unravel within the question of, people getting organized because a lot of people will not be able to be doing theater at the moment or be looking at different ways of doing it so that's a lot of things just to throw in again at the end i mean we discussed it all the time but it again it came up and i thought it was worth just noting that it's, so any uh, final points yeah. for us paul and on that or anything yeah. else <clears throat> well it's just i think in a funny way that reflects really nicely on what i was saying just before which is that theater is interesting because it, it's it, it can be done with so little um mm. you know and and the format's there the format has been established over hundreds of years you know maybe maybe a great deal more than that mm. if we go back to the greeks but i mean it's also changed a lot I, I wouldn't really although it's the same principle you couldn't really you wouldn't you know it's going to see a greek theater show all that time ago wouldn't really compare <laughs> it's the well, same sort of experience let's hang on we're gonna, we're gonna we're gonna interview somebody from cyprus um obviously it's not greece yes, um I, ra- I rather suspect they weren't around during the days of greece. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but- anyway, I, I could go finish up some points there because i can hear i can i can hear jonas knocking on the door what i'm he's, trying he's, to say he's telling me to pull the plug on you what i'm trying to say is um that basically the you know like 
you, you, you've done a lot of work in the left and, a, and all of the way, the way, the whole kind of attitude of drawing people together. It might be starting with uh, only a handful, but of like minded people who have uh, concerns, who have a, a vision, who have uh, and, and can organize themselves and do stuff. We've, we, we and you have done it. You've done it in, in politics and in music, in music. We and you have done it like organizing a local music scene. Theatre is kind of like one of those natural places for that it's always been that uh in, in, in the form we're talking about here the small uh, utilitarian theater company that sort of uh, goes around it's a traveling sort of group of like-minded individuals who are, who are bringing what they do it may not be necessarily overtly political the material like we could be going back several hundred years and talking about a theater company taking like the tragedy of you know, Oedipus around as a show, and you could argue whether or not that's political, but it's political in its nature because it's people coming together, doing something together with a shared vision. And that is something that's uh, always uh, remarkable and something to be, I think, um, treasured. And so the curtain falls. See you again soon, Paul. You take care now. Cheers. Thank you, Dustin, for being our guest on this show. The musical contribution this week comes from our guest Dustin and was written by him, Keaton Wooden and Grayson Shelby. The performers were Virginia Mary Martinez, Keaton Wooden and Grayson Shelby and on the piano and guitar was Grayson Shelby. The song is called Hard Work. Enjoy. to us then join our Facebook group or contact us at outerspace.com that's o-u-t-a hyphen space.com see you soon <laughs>